Well, tonight we're going to be in the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in chapter 22, and so we want to invite you to be there with us. Now, you can follow along in, the, in a copy of the scriptures, or you can use one of the little booklets that we provided for you at the front of the door. Now, quick FYI, uh, if you picked up one of the booklets last week, you might know that we made it halfway through uh, the chapter 22, and so you might just think, well, I already have the booklet from last week. We did it differently this time because of some things I'll explain in a moment. So if you need a, a fresh booklet, you can pick it up because it really covers the rest of chapter 22 and part of chapter 23. So if you're looking to grab that, again, they are in the back and invite you to do that. If you're joining us online, we want to make sure that you're invited to as well and let you know that if you're wanting a copy of the booklet, you can go to our website, go to calvaryroswell.com, go into the messages, go under uh, the Wednesday night messages. You'll see today's message already linked there. Click that. And the only thing that will be available is to be able to download the notes right now, because obviously we're just beginning this. And so, but we'd invite you to be able to do that so that you could follow along and then mark this up. I mean, really, that's part of the intention is that you would grab this and, and just any way that would work for you. I'll use some different things on the screen, uh, but you can do it anyhow you want. But in one sense, you'd be able to follow this and see that which God has for you and hoping that he would be the source of, of your strength and, and need tonight. So let's take another moment. Let's go before him in prayer and ask him for that. Let's just ask him that he would be the one that would open up his scriptures to us tonight and that he would give you and I that which we need out of this this evening. So before him, let's ask him right now. Father, thank you that you are a faithful God. Thank you for your truth. That is the truth. God, would you be the one that speaks that? into our lives this evening? Would you open it up to us and give us understanding? Would you help us to understand how this applies into our lives and where there's needed correction? Would you bring that? Lord, where you want to speak something to us that would be uplifting and guiding and helping, Lord, do that. Meet us this evening so that in this we not only understand the passages, but God, what you would say to us would be spoken to us personally. You can do that. I love that you do that. Please do that tonight. I ask for it for me and for all of us here as we trust you with this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Proverbs 22, we pick it up this evening in verse 17. And I don't know if you're following along in the scriptures how that reads to you. Some of them will say at the top of it, you know, sayings of the wise. And we come across kind of an interesting section in the midst of the book of Proverbs, in the midst of this you know, section on wisdom where God unpacks for us what he would say to us. Part of what makes it interesting is because of its arrangement. In fact, scan on down if you want to for a moment to on the next page. And we'll start there where it says in verse 20, Have I not written to you excellent things of counsel and, and knowledge? One of the interesting things is that word excellent and the Hebrew is an interesting kind of word that could go actually a couple of different directions. Biblical Hebrew uh, wasn't written with vowels. It was just written as consonants. And so as you know, interpreters and Bible students came later to understand them, sometimes the vowels were put in different ways. And many times the context really helped uh, understand exactly what the wording was. And so for many Bible translations, it uses the word excellent. And it's a possibility. But Honestly, maybe a far better possibility would be the word 30. Now, that's interesting in, a, in, in an interesting way because, well, this section that runs from chapter 22, verse 17 to 23, chapter 21, it really does have a similarity. Um, it seems to be patterned after the 30 say, sayings of, I can't say his name, but he's an Egyptian uh, wisdom writer, uh, you know, that would write all these things. And, and so it's an interesting thing that this, you know, Egyptian, you know, book of wisdom that was there really has some similarities to this. So much so that, you know, Hebrew students and Bible students say there's no doubt, you know, that what we're looking at, you know, is patterned after that. That so this, this, this Egyptian writer had written these, these 30 sayings that were principles of wisdom, and none of them are repeated uh, here in this section although nine of them have similar subjects at the same order. And so they'd be like, okay, this is kind of interesting. And it just, you know, raises some interesting questions like, well, so what is this? How, how would this? It's definitely not God that, 
you know, God's borrowing anything from the world. I- instead, it more likely is, in one sense, God saying, well, you want wisdom, let me give you real wisdom. You want 30 sayings, I'll give you 30 sayings. You know, you, you, you want 30 pieces of wisdom, 30 nuggets, let me give you true things. And none of them, you know, match that, but it does speak to that. Lots of interesting things about that. 30 is an interesting number in those days, a, a lunar uh, you know, month. And so for many of them, it was almost like one for each day of the month, you know, just to process through. And so some think that these were memorized and you know, kind of fun ways to see that. And so without spending any more time you know, trying to figure out you know, why you know, he, you know, we, we don't know. I mean, exactly, again, it could just be speaking to us saying, hey, I'll give you what real wisdom is, and that's likely what it is. We just want to note that this section is interesting. Like right in the midst of the book of Proverbs, he just pauses and says, I'm going to give you 30 sayings. And so here's what we want to do. We want to work through this section and we want to find out what these are. But we just want to highlight that, you know, count them up to up to 30, just kind of looking at what they are. Here's these 30 nuggets. And so in some ways, we're going to do it a little bit differently instead of, you know, because in this section, uh, it sw- shifts a little bit. If you've been with us in Proverbs, pretty much every verse is stood alone. Uh, that within one verse would be a nugget of truth. And in that verse, it would have a, a, a play between two phrases or a, a building between two principles. That's different here. Sometimes it will just be a verse. Sometimes it'll be five or six verses uh, that just unpack a principle. So we're going to try to find just the principles. Kind of do that so it won't be quite as, you know, highlighting every word or that, but kind of looking at the main things that he's going to seek to give us there. Again, with a place of saying, okay, there's 30 nuggets here, 30 pieces of wisdom for us to understand. Well, let's back up, turn back a page to to verse 17, because it begins, and it really begins with, in many ways, almost an intro, an intro to the 30 sayings of the wise, kind of almost an invitation uh, again to this, which is really similar to the early uh, chapters of the book of Proverbs. For some of you guys who are with us, you'll recognize some of the same invitations that are said in a way of inviting you into God's wisdom. He simply says it this way, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them all be fixed upon your lips. Pause there and just think about it for a moment. He's just inviting you. He says, I want you to really pay attention. I want you to incline your ears to to the words of wisdom so that it would be there. I want you to apply your heart. I want you to see you're not just listening, but you're, you know, fully kind of saying, okay, I want to understand, you know, what these things are and do so in a way that you keep them. Like it'll be pleasant. He says, it'll be really good for you if you, these would be things that not only do you see, but you would hold that you would say, okay, I want to make sure that these are nuggets that apply into my life. He says, let them be fixed there. Let them be held fast. And he tells us what they would do. He says, here's really the aim. I mean, the ultimate aim behind these nuggets of wisdom is that you would trust, your trust may be in the Lord. That he says, here's what I'm longing for you to do so that you would get this. You would say, okay, yeah, I get it. And, And God is my trust and God is my hope. You know, it's such a simple thing, I suppose, and yet it is so incredibly profound. It is so much what God is calling us to, to be a people who in our space and place would be able to say, God, I trust you. I, yeah, I trust you in your ways. I trust you in, in, in what you're doing. I trust you in the plans that you have. I trust you in, in the way that you would guide and unpack and lead my life. He says, that's where this is supposed to go. And if it works well inside you, not only would you you know, learn 30 nuggets that are just principles that are there, you would say, God, you're right, and I trust you. I trust you for my life. I trust you in what you have for me. I trust you in in where that's going. God would do that, and he'd call us to that. And so here it just says, here's what I'm doing. I'm instructing you. That's what these things are. That's what these nuggets are here that would do that. He continues it there, on the next page, he says, have I not written to you, again, excellent things, or again, maybe very possibly 30 things of counsel and knowledge. I have not given you these things that I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth, that you may answer words of truth to those who send you. He says, not only would it help you uh, to trust God, but you would know how solid these things are. 
you would understand that what God says isn't, you know, open to the whims of our world, and it doesn't change with, you know, the passing opinions. You would know that these things are solid. You would know what they are, but it would also be that you would have an answer, an answer to speak to those who send to you, who would ask you, you know, well, what do you think, and, and how do you see life, and how do you do it? It's like, I could tell you what God says. I, I could tell you how he sees that, and, and, and I could show you what that is, and so Again, it's almost with this invitation. He says, this is what these 30 sayings are. These are what they're aiming to do. And again, kind of the book of Proverbs began this way in much the same way, just saying, I'm inviting you to get it. I'm inviting you to understand it. I'm inviting you to comprehend these things so that it would work this in you. May God make that so. May he do it more than I can do this evening that, you know, even out of, we, we won't make it through all 30 this evening. We're going to do our best to make it through as many as we can. But may it be even in the ones we cover that you would find yourself saying, God, I trust you. And, and God, what you say is right. And what you say is right. And, and that, that's, that, that's the answer I need. And maybe even the answer I would be able to speak into some of the situations that find themselves being thrust before me. That's God's aim. May God make it so more in your life than, than, than any of us could even comprehend. All right. So the first of the 30 is found in verses 22 and 23. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. So the first one, I'll kind of just put it up at the top of it. The first of the 30 simply says, don't do it. Don't, don't rob the poor just because you can. Don't, don't, don't take advantage of those who have no ability to defend themselves just because you can get away with it just because it would, it, would, it would work that way. Don't oppress, he says, with that, the afflicted at the gate. Those who would almost have the idea of, of no ability to defend themselves, no recourse. And those days, the city gate was, was really the place of, of legal, uh, where you went to, to solve problems. It would almost be a court. And so some translations even would say this, you know, don't oppress the afflicted or the poor in court. Don't don't take advantage of them. In many ways, it's saying the same thing. It's a good word. It's a good word just to look at us and say it right now. That you know, as we think about things, it, you know, God says, I want you to take care. I want you to don't, don't be cruel. Don't take advantage of somebody just because you can get away with it. And the sad reality is that's sometimes what people do. You know, it's like, well, you know, who's going to stop me? Nobody, nobody can make me, you know, you know, there is nothing you can do to, to make me not do this. And so the, the sad reality is we have a world that so often preys on, on those who can't defend themselves and, and, and those who are in that sense in those places. And he says, don't do it. Don't do it. And then he gives us the reason. Because the Lord, the Lord will plead their cause. You know, the God, God will be the one that takes up their defense, that God will be the one that, that does that, and he will plunder the soul of those who plunder them. There's an interesting little interchange between the word rob and plunder. They are almost the same. And so in one sense, he's going to say, you rob the poor, I will rob you. You know, that you, I'll, I'll take from you, but it's not from your checking account. It's from your soul. It says your soul pays the price. Your soul begins to work that. And God, God lays that out in this immensity of weight that it's, it's enough. I mean, it's more than enough to say, it doesn't matter if you can get away with it. You know, God is the one who sees people. And, and God is the one that takes them seriously. And so he calls us away from, from those who would do that, of taking advantage of anybody, you know, just because you can, because God's going to be their defense. God's going to be the one that would be that. And that's a good word. That's a good warning to us. It's a good encouragement if you find yourself even in such a space. Flip the page. Verse 24 and 25, it finds the second of 30. It says, make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. Be very careful, he says, about having a friendship. And the idea here is being a close friend. Uh, you know, certainly he's not telling us to avoid people in the world. You know, that's certainly biblical. Jesus was a, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I mean, if we weren't, you know, speaking to anybody in the world, then how could we give them the gospel? But there's a place where you allow people into your inner circle, where you allow someone not just to be someone that you share the gospel with, but that you have a friendship. And he says, hey, you need to be careful. 
If, if you have somebody who's, who's an angry person, a furious person, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't let them be, that be your friendship. Don't, don't let it go that way. And those two lines are pretty much saying the same thing. And then he tells us why. He says, you, unless you learn his ways, it will affect you. You're, you're, you know, how that person processes life will begin to affect the way that you process life. And he says, it'll set a snare for your soul. It's an interesting thing because the idea of a, of a snare for your soul obviously would have the idea of a trap, but it's almost connected in the Hebrew. So it would have it like this way, like, like this will certainly work this way. There is no escape from, if you do that, this will trap you. It, it will pull you. There's nobody who could sit there and say, it, it won't do that. It, it won't work that. I found myself thinking about it, and I thought about, you know, one of those familiar verses in the New Testament where Paul warns us, and he says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. He says, just don't, don't, don't lie to yourself. Don't think, well, it doesn't, it won't affect me. <laughs> it, doesn't, it, won't, it won't do, he says, you're, you're, you're deceiving yourself. If you choose to have evil company, if you choose to have those kinds of, you know, people who are walking poorly as your close friends, it will corrupt you. And then it just simply says it this way. It says, awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He says, I'm telling you guys, so you, you, you want to turn towards righteousness. You want to walk in this way. But the sad thing is that some don't get it. And, and that becomes this place that, that traps you, which is exactly what it's saying here in Proverbs. Where it's saying, you know, don't do that. It will move you. It will affect you. It will cause you uh, to be moved down a direction that you do not want to go. Choose your friends wisely. It's kind of the, es the essence of the message there, and so much needing to ha follow that. All right. Verse 26 and 27, same page, comes the, the third of the 30. Do not be one of those who shakes hands in a pledge, one of those who is a surety for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take away your bed from under you? So it becomes a familiar warning. If you've been with us in the book of Proverbs, pretty much all of the 30 ones that we're going to see in the midst of this are things that we've already seen. And it just warns us about being a surety, about somebody who would, you know, be that person that supplies somebody else's debts. The idea of a surety isn't usually just signing for a single thing, like I'm signing for you to get a car or something. That it says, I'm going to be your, like, anything you do is on me. Like, I'm your you know, you know, backup that will take anything that's there, and it's a warning. It's a warning that calls us away from that. He says, if you did that, you, what happens when, you know, they come to collect, and you have nothing which was to pay, and they take away what you have? They take away what you have. So simply putting it into a quick application, it's not saying don't ever, you know, co-sign for somebody, but if I can say it to you this way, biblically, don't co-sign for somebody that you're not willing to pay for it, like the whole thing. Like, if, if you co-sign, be willing. I mean, don't, don't ever be caught in the midst of that. There's a place of not being a part of that. That said, there's more in this verse, and we've spent more time talking about that in other spaces in the book of Proverbs, that it would have the idea of not just of, you know, being somebody's financial help. It's the idea of really, in many ways, enabling them and, you know, getting behind them and, and being a place where you become uh, one that carries everything that they are um, and so calling us away from that, but just a good nugget of wisdom that would rescue us uh, from a place that God would have us not to go. All right. Next page. Verse 28, that's the number four. Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. It's a warning. Again, you need to understand in those days that in part just picture, the, again, the idea of theft and taking advantage of people. In those days, you could almost think about even when Joshua brings the children of Israel into the land and they separate, you know, the, 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 the tribes into boundaries and they'd mark them off. And so you'd have family markings. You'd have these, you know, markings that say, hey, this is, you know, where it is. This is the ancient landmark that marked my family. And so, again, deceptive people would kind of move it, you know, and, and begin to steal, you know, away things and, and erode people's lands. And so in one sense, he's calling us away from that. That said, there seems to be more weight to it. Uh, that it speaks not just of physical landmarks, but in many ways spiritual landmarks. 
that in one sense don't erode, you know, the, the lessons that God has sown into history. Don't be the one that, you know, steps into a space and undoes and, and moves these marks, you know, that we would be that sense of being able to, to heed in one sense the old paths and be able to say, okay, I, I, I'm not moving from those things that have been there, not removing the, the, the weight of those things in the midst of it. And it's a good warning. Verse 29. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. So this is number five. And, and he just calls us to see it, to watch somebody who excels in what they do, who, you know, whatever their job is, whatever it is that they're accomplishing, boy, they do it well. They do it well. He says, when you see that, know this. Hey, that, that will go well. You'll, you'll see that person standing before a king. You'll see that person you know, using that and and doing incredibly well and how many open doors that has. So the nugget is, it's not a promise that necessarily that everybody who does this gets that, but it is a nugget that calls us to, well, if we could say it this way, excellence. That it says, you know, that, that there is a place in life away from laziness, away from the things that Proverbs has called us away from, into doing things well. In fact, I like the way it tells it to us this in Colossians. In Colossians 3, verse 23, it says, And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men. Whatever you do, do it well. I mean, do it well as you're doing it to the Lord. And in context, the idea is speaking about, you know, whether it's your, whatever your job is, whatever, you know, the space that you spend your days doing, do it well. Do it well. You know, do, you know, there is no sense that God is looking for any of us just to skive by, just to be like, hey, I just want to get through as, with as little work as I can possibly do. And he says, not, I want you to do something. I want you to do it well. If, you're gonna, it's, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing. That there's something about the, the kind of Christian value in that that he's calling us to. Now, interesting enough, I found myself thinking about this and when Jesus would speak about it. And in Luke 16, he was talking about finances and, and, and how we'd handle that. And even, again, a little bit even into how we'd handle our lives and employments. He says, he who is, un- who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. He says, if you're going to be you know, unfaithful in something insignificant, then you're going to be unfaithful in bigger things as well. If you can't be faithful with something small, if you can't be faithful with something small, you won't be with something bigger. Therefore, if you've not been, fit, been faithful, Jesus says, an unrighteous mammon or in money and how you handle your money, who's going to commit to you the true riches? Who's going to trust in you the, the eternal treasures and, 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 and what would be there? Because there is a sense that, you know, faithfulness and, you know, ability in the midst of that opens that up where God would bless. And that's a fascinating thing, even if you take it back to our proverb and say it this way. You know, you see somebody who's excelling in their work? They'll stand before kings. They'll stand before the king. They'll stand before him. And, and, and he will say, I can trust you with more. I can, you know, your faithfulness in something that seems insignificant, you know, is molding your character in a way that that can be a place that I can bless. And it certainly is a place for God to, you know, call us to say, okay, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it well. I, I want to I be that. And it should mark us in many ways. It should mark who we are and certainly calls us into that. All right. Well, you can flip the page and we move from chapter 22 to chapter 23. uh, But again, we're still on this list of 30 things. And so in chapter 23, we have the first three verses that find number six uh, of the 30 principles. It says, when you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you. And put a knife to your throat if you're a man given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. When you sit down with a ruler, with somebody who's in power, somebody who's, who's powerful in that way, he says, be very careful. Consider carefully what you eat. And, it, and he just kind of repeats that in a very visual way. It's like, okay, if you're really drawn, if you're that person given to appetite, you should just put a knife to your throat. Like, okay, don't get caught. You know, don't, don't be pulled into this because he says, don't desire it. Don't desire what he has because they're deceptive. They're deceptive in the way it would work. Dave Guzik in his commentary said it this way. The powerful do not give away their favors for free. They want something in return. And it's generally much more than what they've invested. One can lose one's own soul in the exchange. 
So she kind of kind of in a place of like, okay, you just, you know, power, powerful, it, it's often that way. And, and just being very wary of that, being aware of that so that you protect who you are. I think if we need, you know, an example of that, maybe one of the best examples is Daniel. You know, you get it in Daniel chapter 1 that he is taken uh, into captivity there, and, and then he's brought into the king's courts, and it lets us know that the king puts before him all of his delicacies and, and, and all of his food brought from his table. And, and for many reasons, Daniel knows he's not supposed to take that. It would be something that would go, go against the, the principles for his being a, a follower of, of, of the Lord in the Old Testament, but also just understanding where it was. And so you have this amazing verse that gives us a picture of Daniel's character in Daniel chapter 1, where it says Daniel purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. He's like, I'm, no, I, I see what that is. I, I know where that goes, and I want to take it. And, you know, he goes and he reasons with the, 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 the king's kind of right-hand guy, and, he, and, and they allow him not to have to be a part of it and still serve in the midst of it. But it's a good picture uh, of something where you just recognize, boy, there's a careful way to handle this. There's a careful way to do this so that he's telling us, hey, you should be that person who, like Daniel, is able to say, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be hoodwinked. I'm not going to be kind of drawn into that because there, there's something about the way that this works that it will cost you more than you want to pay. It'll do worse in you than you want. And so it's better to say, no, I just not, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to desire those things of somebody who is seeking to do that. And it's just, again, another place of wisdom that helps us navigate some of the roads that we walk down and go, okay, that's, that's not a good space. I see where that would go, and, I, and I'd get trapped. It would do something in my life that would go overly badly. And so, again, calling us to be like Daniel and, and be one that would say, no, I'm a purpose in my heart and say no to that. Verse in four and five at the bottom of the page have the, the next one gets the number seven of the 30. Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings and they fly away like an eagle toward heaven. What a good nugget. I mean, it just tells us, hey, don't do it. Don't become somebody that lives your life just for money, just thinking, I just need more. I just need more. I want more. I want more. I want more. Don't get caught up into that trap that consumes so many people in our world. He says, you should understand. You should understand what that is. You should understand that that's not the way it works, and your understanding should keep you from doing that. And then he just gives it to us in that visual way. And you've heard it probably before. Maybe you didn't even, you know, think about it from a biblical premise. You know, it's like, my money has wings and just flies away. You know, it's like, it is, it is there, it is gone, you know, kind of deal. He says, you know, you, you, why would you set your eyes on it? You know what it does. You, it can be there for a moment and it can be gone just that quickly, just that quickly. And it, it can. There's not anything that you have financially right now that if, if the world didn't shift radically, if, if something happened that all of our you know, value could be just gone like that. And so he says, don't set your heart there. Don't, don't be that person that lives for earthly treasure. You know, I found myself thinking of Jesus when he talks about this in Matthew 6. And he says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you'll put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Isn't life so much more than what you own? Isn't life so much more than money? Yes, yes, it indeed is. He goes on to say, therefore, don't worry about what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear, for after these things the Gentiles seek. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. I mean, he's not ignorant of the way that he designed us and knows that we need food. And, and, and he says he knows, and he tells us he cares for that. But he just invites us. He says, okay, but you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. God can take care of those things. But don't let that be your focus. Hey, it's a good word. It's a good word, and it's one that needs to be heard. Uh, maybe, again, for you here this evening, you're, you read this uh, number seven of the list, and you're like, I, I, I live that. I, I've walked that. But maybe you're trapped with it right now. A a again, because there's the trap. It's like how much, you know, just, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. You know, just need a, you know, more money in the account. Just need the bigger car. Need the, 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 great, the bigger house. Or, and, and you get caught in this cycle with it. It isn't life. In fact, you invest yourself in that which could go away in a moment. 
that Jesus says, moth and rust will destroy. He says, don't set your heart there. Your understanding, your understanding should rescue you from this, not circumstances. Don't wait for circumstances to fix it where, you know, okay, yeah, so I did lose the job. I guess I'm no longer going to be that, that worried about money. It's like, no, you're, you, what should fix this in your mind is that you know that's not life. That's not worth, that's not worth investing my life into. Don't overwork to be rich. Good word. All right, turn the page. Number eight, found there in verse six, seven, and eight. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel that you have eaten will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. So kind of a similar warning to a moment ago we talked about the powerful and, and being careful in the midst of it. But here he says this is that person who is a miser. This is, well, this is Ebenezer Scrooge. That's probably the easiest way to do it. This is the person... They, they have money, and they don't enjoy it. They don't, they, don't, they don't enjoy it themselves, and they don't intend on anybody else really enjoying it. This is that person who, you know, does that. He says, so here he is. You know, he's in this place. He thinks in his heart. That's who he really is. That's, that's what he's saying. And, and what's happening on the inside is that real person. So even though, you know, he might say, oh, yeah, here, you can eat and drink, but it's not really where his heart is. It's not really what's there, and, and, and really behind it becomes so many problems. And so he says, even if you were to partake in it, that morsel that you've eaten will vomit up. I mean, like, and it's this powerful, like, it's, it's going to come back, and you're not going to enjoy it. You know, it's like, it doesn't, you know, again, I think you can kind of get the visual picture there, and uh, it says it'll be a waste of that. And so he says, here's the thing. So if that's where you are, if that's that kind of person that you're looking at this Ebenezer Scrooge, and you're like, man, it's got money. <laughs> like, I thought he was going to kind of hang out with him, you know, and, you know, maybe be his friend, and he's like, don't, don't, don't want what he has. Don't, don't set your heart on it, because even if he shares with you, it doesn't really mean it, and somehow it, it's, it's as if all by itself, his miserliness causes anything that he shares with you to be that kind of thing that turns your stomach, that's like, oh, that's, oh, it's just, it is not a pleasant thing, and so the idea, again, is just, just don't do it. Don't desire those things. Don't, don't find yourself pursuing that because it would be an undoing. All right. Verse 9 uh, is number 9 of the 30. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the words of wisdom. So here's a fool, someone who doesn't want wisdom, and he just says it's a waste. It's a waste for you to do it because he'll despise it. It's a waste for you to, you know, try in many ways for the person who's not even interested in listening. Jesus told us the same thing, unless that sounds harsh. You're like, man, that just sounds uh, unchristian. It's like, well, Jesus told us, you know, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. He says there's, there's places where it's like this is not a place to invest. They're not listening. They're not open. There, there's no reception. There's no you know, it, it, for me to spend hours, you know, investing into this conversation or hours, it's like it becomes something that it doesn't even work. They're not listening. It, it, it is not worth doing. It's casting your pearls before swine. It's a waste of time. A waste of time to do that and guides us, calls us away from that. Verse 10, uh, that brings us to number 10. Do not remove that ancient landmark, nor enter into the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty, and he will plead their cause against you. So it's kind of similar. It's kind of similar to number four, right, where he talked about not removing the landmark, but very specifically here, it's kind of encapsulated with the idea of the fatherless. He says, don't remove the ancient landmark, nor enter into the fields of the fatherless. And you could just imagine it for a moment. You can imagine, you know, here you have somebody who, you know, they, they, they end up being orphaned young or they, you know, their, their, their parents die and now they're the inheritance of that and it would be very easy for people to take advantage uh, of that type of space. And yet here he just tells us don't do that because their redeemer is mighty. Their redeemer, their goel, their, their one who would step into that and say I will be that one who will, who will be their rescuer and, and fix that He's mighty, and he will plead their cause against you. It's just, again, an invitation for us to say, okay, you know, kind of way back where we were in the very first one, just because you can get away with it don't, that doesn't mean do it, because God is seeing it. I think about it this way. God tells us, I like in, 
Psalm 68, that he says he's a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. That God very quickly looks upon these who so easily become those who are taken advantage of and says, I will defend them. You, you take advantage of them, you've now crossed me. You've now crossed me, and he calls us away from that space again and being at the opposite end of it, that we should be those who care for the widows and the orphans, which by God's grace we desperately and, and, and want to do and continue doing. All right. Well, verse 12 finds itself in the next one, uh, the number 11, and it's kind of in many ways almost a restatement of the invitation. In fact, some would say it's not really one of the, the numbers, and they would break apart the 30 a little bit differently, and they'd say it's just a, a refreshing of, of in calling us to it, where he just simply says, apply your heart. Apply your heart to, to uh, uh, instruction. Like, you should look at this and think, I, I want to know this. Like, I want these things to permeate my life. And your ears uh, to the words of knowledge, that it ought to be that as we approach God's word and even the things that we're talking about tonight, it should be like, I want to understand what that looks like in my life. I want to be the kind of person that walks in the wisdom that God has given. And, and he says, the only way you're going to be able to do this is, is to apply yourself, apply your heart and say, I'm listening, I'm wanting to learn because that would grow us in God's ways. Hopefully that's happening right now. Hopefully right now you're here, even now, hoping that God would just speak to you and, and that he would be the one that would work this in your life. May he do that well. Flip the page, and we'll get number 12. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Uh, you shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. So it's this call to parenting, to, to parents raising their children. He says, don't withhold correction. Don't be the one that fails to to, to to discipline your children and walk in that. Again, a familiar message for those who've been with us in Proverbs, speaking to the parents, grandparents that are here this evening saying, okay, that's, that's, that's not where we want to do because he says, you know, you need to do it. He says, if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. It's kind of a funny picture. I mean, I think it's really meant to be that way, but it also very quickly lays out the parameters. We're definitely not talking about abuse. I mean, some people would read these things and like, man, you know, doesn't that kind of create spaces in Christians where they would be abusive? Not biblically. Like he says, that's, that's not it. Discipline isn't, it isn't ever that which, you know, would become, you know, a death blow or something to a child. It's just meant to discipline them. And, and there's a way of speaking that. Now, again, I, I don't know even how that kind of lands across for me, but I know this. I mean, uh, in raising our, our girls, uh, we, we definitely tried, and I can actually remember <laughs> quoting this to them. It's like, you're not going to die. You know, this ain't going to be fun, but you're not going to die. You know, it said so right here in the Proverbs, you know, but that's how they feel. I mean, if you've ever, you know, kind of tried to walk this into, your, you know, kid in discipline, it's like, I'm going to die. You're like, you know, you're, you're punishing me. It's like, well, yeah, I am, you know, but you're not going to die. But here's what I know. He says, if you, if you beat him with a rod, my, your goal is to deliver his soul from hell. I'm more concerned about your character than I am your enjoyment of the day. I'm more concerned about growing you into that godly person and, and rescuing you from hell than I am just about surviving the moment. And, and again, that's just a worthy thing to think through for a moment. Again, for those parents who would be there, part of the problem with discipline is it really is hard. It's easier not to. It is just easier not to. It is easier just to whatever, you know, just, you know, you just, we'll just kind of, you know, get past this or whatever. Discipline's it's costly, it's hard, but it's worth it because you're not trying to just enjoy the moment. You're trying to rescue. You're trying to, to, to be in that incredible place of influence. And parents, that's you. You have more power uh, over your children than anything else does. Don't let the world lie to you. It, it's trying. And all of the media and everything else in there, but you have more. And yet there's a sense of using it well. Uh, of saying, you know, I, I want to I be that one that seeks to, to raise them well and to deliver, and may God work that uh, through our families. All right. Verse 15, uh, we'll get number 13. We'll probably do a couple more, and that will be as far as we'll make it this evening, but help you just to kind of see this. In verse 15, we get number 13. It says, my son, if your heart is wise, my heart will rejoice. Indeed, I myself. Yes, I, my innermost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. 
it's an invitation, uh, speaking to the one who would be listening to this. The, the idea of the, of the father speaking to the child, the idea of the teacher speaking to the student that would say, here's the thing, if you, you're, if you would be wise, if your heart is wise, then here's what's going to happen. I'd rejoice. I would find incredible joy. My innermost being would rejoice when your lips would speak right things. You know, it gives it to us in 2 John, where it begins and says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. And, and it is this understanding that, yeah, as parents and those, we can discipline, we can speak life, but we still can't make the choices. I, I, you know, we wish we could. I, I know that you understand where maybe I would go with this. Maybe it's a child, maybe it's a friend, and there are days that you're like, if I could just jump into their head and, you know, turn it, you know, like, change why they're doing, like, why are you doing this? You know, it's like, stop, you know, but you can't. I mean, you, you get to influence, you get to speak, but it's almost this place saying, I would have incredible joy if you would make the right choice. I, I would have incredible joy if, if you would be that one, that if you would be wise, if your lips, lips would speak right things, that would be my joy. I mean, no greater joy than, than to find that that would be there, but it is this almost recognition that that's on you. And, and I, I, you know, parents, you could say that to your children. I can say that as a pastor to you. I wish I could make the choices for you. I wish I could easily, I can't. But what incredible joy to see those who would say, I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to walk in God's ways. I'm following God. And, and it just invites us into that space of choosing and walking and all of those things and the things that he would have for us. All right. Verse 17, number 14. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day, for surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Don't do it. Don't envy those who are living in sin. Don't envy those who have their lives focused on that. And there's such a propensity of this, that we can look at those in the world that seem to be doing well. I think about Psalm 37, it speaks of this, like don't set your heart on it. Don't, don't find yourself being moved in this. He says, instead, you should be zealous for the fear of the Lord all the day. Don't want what the world has. Don't want their pattern. Instead, say, God, I want what you have. I, I, want, I want to fear God. That's the nature of wisdom. You know, fear God. Uh, that place of the beginning of wisdom is found in this place of living in light of the reality of God and, and walking in that. So he's inviting us into a world that sometimes, again, it, you, you could look at it and say, okay, you know, being worldly seems to get people ahead, both in business or finances, and he says, but don't envy that. Don't want what they have. Instead, you should choose to say, I want to be zealous for God, and then he invites us to see why. He says, for surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. For surely there is a hereafter. The English comes across a little bit funny, because when I say surely, it might sound like, well, we hope so. You know, like, surely that's going to happen. You know, that's not the way it is. It has the idea of absolutely solidly. When it says surely, like, this is sure. Like, this is, this is not something that's a maybe. This is something that's absolutely true. And because there is a hereafter, your hope will not be cut off. Your hope will not be cut off. We might say this differently. We might say that in one sense, heaven changes everything. That if you're going to look at life and say, it's not about now, <laughs> it's not about, you know, the, the, the way everything, I, I know that this is not the end of the story. That I look at it and say, that's the end of the story. And I'm more interested in standing before God than I am having what the world says would make me happy. I'm more interested in pleasing Him than, than having any of those things. And this becomes a familiar familiar just invitation all the way through the scriptures. And I just want to invite you to it right now. I mean, I, I, I look at this and say, the, the weird thing is that you could be in this room, and honestly, not everybody in this room is doing this. For some of you, you, you find yourself, you know, really kind of looking at what the world has and thinking, well, the world seems to have it good, or some of these people seem to have it good. I think about Asaph in Psalm 73, who would write about it. It says, it just seems like some of these people there get to he go ahead. And why is it doesn't seem fair? But he says, you just need to see that this is not the end of the story. 
you know, that even though somebody could get rich or, or do that, and you think about Jesus telling the story of the, of the rich man who builds his barns, and he builds bigger barns, and he builds bigger barns, and Jesus is like, he's a fool. He's a fool. Because in a moment, he's going to lose everything he's invested, in, and he's going to stand before God. You should be living for that. You should be living, it's like, I'm more concerned and, and living in the fear of God than I am being envious and, and jealous for anything that this world has. God invites us into a place that would see that, wow. And can I pause and just say this? You know, one of the, the nuggets that flows through all the way through scriptures is if you see this, then there ought to be a sense of being ready for that. And one of the things we always know is the only way that you can be ready for that is with Jesus. You know, Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father any other way. Just because there's a heaven doesn't mean you're going unless you know him. Unless you have him, unless you have what we've spoken of this evening in, in worship where we're saying, hey, I see that, I want that, and I have confidence there. It's the only way I can have hope. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't. But if you do, he just invites us to be able to look at that and see that. All right, well, I'm going to leave that. Let's do one more just so we make it halfway through the 30, and then we'll pick it up next week and see if we can finish it. So verses 19, 20, and 21, giving us number 15. Hear, my son, and be wise, and guide your heart in the way. Do not mix with wine-bibbers or with gluttons, eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and the drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. So in the midst of this, there's really just a simple principle that he says, okay, don't mix with wine-bibbers or, or gluttons or eater, you know, gluttonous eaters of meat, and it would have the idea of those who would come to poverty. The idea is very simply that this warning against associating with those who are living extravagantly wasteful lives. Uh, it's, it's just this place of understanding how dangerous that would be, that there are some that would say, you know, yeah, I just, you know, I want, I want the finest of, of foods. I want, you know, the best of things. It doesn't matter. And he says, if you look at that, it's going to take somebody, it's going to ruin them. It'll take them to po poverty. And it has this interesting idea that their drowsiness will clothe them a man with rags. And Kind of just a fun, little, like, you know, almost the idea that they, you know, you know indulge themselves in the things of the world, even though it's, 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 it's t breaking them financially. It's taking everything they have and, and would move us away from that. And he just says, don't let that be the thing that draws you. Don't let that be the kind of thing. Just find yourself being rescued. So it's kind of an interesting thing. There's a bunch of stuff here in these 30 uh, nuggets of wisdom but in this first 15, one of the key things over and over is be very careful with who you associate with. Like, don't associate with the angry person. Be careful when you're with the powerful person or the miser or, or, or the gluttonous person who is just wasteful with their, and extravagant with their money. It is this place that invites us to choose carefully the, those influences and places in our life. And that's just a good place for us to end this evening. You know, we think about everything that's there. There is a space uh, that just calls us to walk wisely in the things of God, walk wisely in the, the things and the things that would influence us. You know, and I don't know where that is in your life. You know, you're here at church on a Wednesday night, and so maybe all by itself, that puts you in a good space. I hope so. But maybe not. See, you could be here, and yet you might honestly say, nobody in this room really knows you. Nobody in this room is the person who is influencing your life. So I'm just going to ask you, so who is that? Who do you talk to? Who do you look to for advice? Who do you look to for that, that person that you bear your soul with? And I just want you to, to be very wary of that. If you're choosing the ungodly, if you're choosing the angry, miserly, extravagantly living person, it's affecting your life. It, 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 you might be today like, no, no, they're my friend, but nah, it doesn't affect me. Yes, it does. It, it might not happen overnight, but it does. And God's inviting you not to, again, cut everybody off in your world that's, that's a sinner because then you'd have to cut everybody off and then we wouldn't be the gospel witness that we're supposed to. But he is inviting you to say, hey, choose those well. Choose who you bring into that space in your life because when you think about wisdom, when you think about the life that you have, they are influencing you. Someone said it well, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Show me who you open up your heart to, and I'll, I'll tell you who you're going to be. 
You know, I'll tell you because you might not be there today, but you will be. And, and, and so the idea is, okay, well, if that's true, then I'm going to choose. I'm, I'm going to choose the people that I allow to speak into my life, that I open up my heart to, and, and, and I'm not going to, you know, choose those who are ungodly or going, you know, crazy, you know, miserly, extra- I'm going to look for some people that are doing well and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to choose them. And, and maybe that needs to change for somebody this evening where you're going to like, I need, I need some godly friends. I, I need some people that would speak into my life because the influences I have, they're moving me in the wrong direction. And, and so God would invite us into a space of moving in a good direction. And again, it's just an interesting place that he just tells us at the very beginning of this, hey, these are God's ways. If you'd listen to us and apply this, you'd find yourself trusting God and saying, God, you're right. You're right. You're, you're right. These, these, are, these are true things that affect my life. And so he'd invite us into a place of trusting him and allowing him to be the one that would direct us. So I don't know where that lands with you, but I leave you with it and just invite you into a space of just letting it be that which guides your life. So let's close in, in prayer, and then we'll close in a couple songs of worship as we just go before God and ask that he would bring us into everything he has for us. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that is true. In the midst of a world of opinions, yours are the nuggets of truth that don't change. Thank you for hope that's found there. Thank you for even these 15 nuggets of wisdom that we quickly walked through. God, where some of them needed to land, not just with understanding, but change. Would you help us to change? Would you help us to choose those paths and courses that would take us down a good road, lead us towards that day that there is a future, and we're going to stand before you. Guide us in that, Lord. Grow us in your ways. I ask that for me and for all of us now. In Jesus' name, amen.